Good morning, everyone. Today's, today's message is labeled uh, the Sermon on the Mount, part five. And, uh, but technically, I'm really wanting to finish up uh, where I left off in part four because I, I left without feeling that I really accomplished what God wanted to speak in that last portion of scripture in Matthew chapter five. <clears throat> and I'm going to uh, probably be reading mostly from the ESV today. So if it doesn't uh, sound quite the same as what Isaiah puts out, that would be the reason for that. So just a quick review. The Sermon on the Mount, which I believe to be the most important teaching that Christ delivered, is the introduction to the New Covenant. A covenant between God and mankind based in grace and mercy and the forgiving of sin, which has Jesus Christ as the mediator of that covenant. This covenant replaced the Old Covenant based on the laws mediated by Moses, laws and ordinances which mankind could not fulfill because the law had no power attached to it. Christ delivered this sermon, this message, this new covenant, not to the crowds who followed him around hoping to see a miracle, not to the people that were there hoping to trip him up to catch him in something that they could accuse him of. He delivered it to his disciples only. That's a very important thing to remember. The ones, his disciples, the ones who believed his doctrine, rested on his sacrifice, imbibed his spirit, and imitated his example. The sermon is found beginning, as I said, in Matthew chapter 5, and begins with the Beatitudes. <coughs> Attitudes to be, not what we should be, or can be, but what we must be in order for us to be one of his disciples. They begin and end with the promise that those who adhere to his teaching will inherit the kingdom of heaven. We also discuss salt and light, examples given by Christ of what we as disciples must be in the world, showing and giving life to those who are of the world these two elements that are essential for survival. Jesus is reminding us that he is showing the way to fulfill what God intended or ordained for mankind from the very beginning. And one, and one must not think he can alter or change that which God has ordained and set in place without serious repercussions. We will read again, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, beginning in 17. <clears throat> Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish these things, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter will pass from the law until everything takes place. So anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and teaches others to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless the righteousness goes beyond that of the experts in the law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So after this portion, we spent some time considering how Christ used, as an example, the experts in the law and scribes, and Pharisees, as examples of what not to do. They, as we discussed, believe themselves quite expert in manipulating the laws to justify their own heart's intent. Christ points out they were only fooling themselves again and again. So from here, beginning in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 48, Christ gives instructions by comparing the new to the old. You have heard it said, he tells us, but I say to you, Jesus drills down at this point and starts speaking about some very specific issues. Anger, murder, adultery, divorce, oaths, retaliation, loving your enemies, and he brings all these to a new level of comprehension and understanding. You have heard it said, but I say to you. Today I want to pick just one example. Uh, from this section to re reinforce the point that I really wanted to get to when I uh, was wrapping up last time. 
And that's found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body go into hell. So these two verses refer to what one sees and touches. And Christ's response is that this is an issue and the appropriate response is to remove them, cut them off, or amputate. And this is where I wanted to spend my time today because I don't know that that was quite literal, frankly. <clears throat> because I believe that the am amputation would not cure the real issue, the heart of the matter, so to speak, which is the heart and mind of people. God, practically from the very beginning, refers to the state of mankind's thoughts. And I'm referring to a time immediately after the flood, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. Genesis 8, 21. And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma and said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind, even though the inclination of their mind is evil from childhood on. I will never again destroy everything that lives as I just have done, even though the inclination of their mind is evil from childhood on. God recognized that from the very beginning. And Jesus himself reinforces this thought elsewhere in Scripture. If you turn to Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 20, Mark 7, 20, he said, What comes out of a person defiles him, for from within, out of the human heart, comes evil ideas, sexual immorality, theft and murder, adultery, greed, evil deceit, debauchery, evil slander, pride and folly. All these evils come from within and defile a person. So you can pluck out your eye and you can cut off your hand, but your heart can still extend your mind down a very, very dark path. So we had, I'm constantly amazed, I should say, that God will tend to speak on a theme and sometimes it's like I'll relate it to a car. If you go buy a car, all of a you start seeing all the similar cars on the road that somebody else else has, just like yours. And Pastor Dan actually a few weeks ago, in part of his message, talked about the heart. And then Pastor Aaron, in closing, mentioned about the heart and heart issues. And then again, last Wednesday, just a few days ago, Pastor Aaron's talking about the heart again. And all this time, it's on my mind. And God keeps bringing it to my mind, too. He's, he's the, the heart of the issue. That's the issue. It's the heart of the issue. And where that heart can lead your mind. So you can pluck out an eye or cut off a hand, but your heart can still send your mind on a very dark path. So this has been rattling around in my mind literally for weeks, even before I was asked to speak. And, it, and it's so related to where I left off on that last message. And when God was reminding me of this in the last few weeks in particular, I, I was reminded of a situation that I witnessed. Um, and, and I shared this previously, and some of you may have heard it, so, so forgive me if you have. But uh, I think I'll, I'll point some things out that I didn't when I mentioned it before. Um, I had to... <clears throat> this, just this last week I saw a cup for sale and I thought of Pastor Aaron, of course, because he's mentioned this in the past and it said, uh, it was a coffee cup, you know, and they get those cute little logos on it. It says, it says Pastor, caution, what you say may become a sermon illustration. <laughs> um, and if it had been in a place I could have bought it, he would have owned it by now, but it was not. But maybe, maybe later. So, where I wanted to go is what I witnessed a few years ago. And some of you will appreciate more this more than others, I think. So let me tell you what I saw. And, and you're going to have to imagine with me, because no one here is at this point. And what happened was, is, is we had visitors in our home, a niece and her young son. And it, the young son being what most people refer to as a toddler. 
Um, but it, to help you imagine, I'll call him a waddler because he was at the stage of learning to walk in the big bulky diaper. Everybody got the picture? So he, uh, he would walk across our living room, or try to, and invariably he would plop down somewhere. And he would either sit there and cry, he would, sometimes he would crawl over to the coffee table or something and help himself up. Sometimes he would sit there and look around for a second and hold his hands up and ask for somebody to help him up. And sometimes he would just actually make it all the way across the living room. And when I saw that occur, I, God really did speak to my heart almost immediately. And he said, that's just like you and so many other people, if you really think about it. Um, he says that uh, that is what we do when we fall, when we stumble. So, after seeing this, and God saying that those child's actions parallel their own so often, I'm saying it's our heart condition shown in the reaction while we travel through our life's trials. Sometimes we stumble and fall, and even when we succeed in our walk, which that little boy did, he would just get so proud of himself. You know, he would just glow with the biggest smile. But pride is one of the areas that God wants to deal with in our life. And we need to be aware of that. And in 2 Kings chapter 5, I'm not going to read that passage because I think you're familiar with, with that Syrian general that it talks about in that passage. He was a very successful man. He had... Uh, uh, gone for a healing to the prophet and he was told to do something and his pride initially told him I don't, I'm not going to do that but when it was pointed out to him if he just humbled himself if he stripped off all his outer coverings bared himself to the world so to speak and did what he was asked he would be healed and so when he let that pride fall and humbled himself. He got the healing that he came seeking. And that's a caution for us. Humbling ourselves is one of the things that we must do. <clears throat> Jesus teaches us that we face the challenges life throws our way. We, we must keep our hearts pure, holding on to our faith in Him. How we act and react is critical for our well-being and even our eternal life. When like the little boy crawling, sometimes to pull himself up, we often think we can lift ourselves up. And we should remind ourselves where our confidence should lie. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Now we have such confidence in God through Christ, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as if it were coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who made us adequate to be servants of a new covenant not based on the letter, but on the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Jesus will supply our confidence as we follow Him, clinging to faith in all He is and has sacrificed for you and for us, allowing us to have the strength needed to overcome our trials with His help. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, for by grace you are saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Faith by grace is a gift from God, given freely, not earned. And Romans 12, 3 says, For by grace given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think more highly of yourselves than you ought to think, but to think with sober discernment, as God has distributed to each of you a measure of faith. So when we draw from that support, that strength that God offers, we can grasp promises He made to others. And there are many in Scripture. But I was really drawn to Jeremiah 29. Uh, this is a promise that He made 
to those who were in Babylonian captivity, but it really applies to us too. Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 13. For I know what I have planned for you, says the Lord. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I have plans to give you a future filled with hope. When you call out to me and come to me in prayer, I will hear your prayers. When you seek me in prayer and worship, you will find me available to you if you seek me with all your heart and soul. God's promises and support are there for his disciple. I believe that our faith is tested day by day and even minute by minute. And I know it's sometimes a lot more evident than others. Um, my tests usually occur when I'm driving through Jamestown. As we go on our daily walk, as we waddle along, teetering, stumbling, falling, we simply must guard our hearts. I find the most precious times to be when, like the little boy, we find ourselves plopped down in the middle of a floor somewhere and realize instead of sitting there crying out, if we just reach out and ask for a hand up, God will do that. Maybe even with a little hug after he does. And he can put us back on a safe path. We just have to realize that God is there to help us out. Reach out, reach out. We're all familiar with the passage in Luke chapter 8, beginning in Verse 43 of the, the woman with the issue of blood. You remember what she did? She pressed through the crowd. She reached out. She grasped hold. And she received. And she was told, Daughter, your faith has made you well. In verse 48. And there's another. The man that would was lame from birth, who sat at the entrance of the temple and Peter walked by. Uh, Acts chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. So the lame man paid attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Stand up and walk. He was asking amiss, but when he reached out, he received what he really needed. Not a hand out, but a hand up. This man sitting at the entrance of the temple reached out. Peter took his hand and he stood up and walked alongside the one who saved him. This is what we all must do. Reach out for the hand that is offered. One that will hold on. Leading the way to the most fulfilling life we could ever hope for. Proverbs tells of the ones who are controlled by worldly thoughts. The toddler who needs no help getting up, the one who doesn't need or thinks he needs any help at all. The one who remains proud of all his accomplishments. Proverbs 6, verses 12 to 15. A worthless and wicked person walks around saying perverse things. He winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, and points with his fingers. little sidebar signals with his feet you know in many cultures if you show someone the bottom of your feet that's the most hideous insult you can give them points of the fingers he plots evil with perverse thoughts in his heart he spreads contention at all times therefore his disaster will come suddenly in an instant he will be broken and there will be no remedy we the disciples are called out of the world. The disciple is not what he can be, not what he should be, but what he must be. James chapter 1 and verse 12 says, Happy is the one who endures testing, because when he has proven to be genuine, he will receive the crown of life that God promised to those who love him. <clears throat> one who endures testing, one whose heart remains pure, that is who we simply must be. Let's close uh, the thought with a portion of Psalms. 
Psalms 24, verses 3 through 5. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Jesus said, You have heard it said, but I say to you, the new covenant taught to the disciples, teaching how one must live, and shown that with grace, mercy, and faith in Jesus Christ, it is possible to fulfill all God has intended for you and for me. We simply must allow Him to do the amputation and the cutting out of the world from our lives. Amen.